welcome to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. My name is Omar Pinto, the host of the SHARE Podcast and a founding member of the SRC, the SHARE Recovery Community. In the SRC, we have a number of live online recovery meetings every week on a number of different topics. This podcast is only one example of the content provided to our members. In this meeting, a chapter of the Tao Te Ching is discussed every week as to how it relates to recovery. I hope you enjoy this week's podcast episode. Hello, everyone. This is Buddy C. This is the March 5th, 2020 Tao Te Ching meeting for the Share Recovery community. Today we have Lala and Marla and Brian and Drew and Craig and Paul. Welcome, everyone. The 73rd chapter of the Tao Te Ching. Paul, you going to read for us, sir? Oh, there's Kirsty. All right, chapter 73, the first translation. A brave and passionate man will kill or be killed. A brave and calm man will always preserve life. Of these two, which is good and which is harmful? Some things are not favored by heaven. Who knows why? Even the sage is unsure of this. The Tao of heaven does not strive, and yet it overcomes. It does not speak, and yet is answered. It does not ask, yet is supplied with all its needs. It seems to have no aim, and yet its purpose is fulfilled. Heaven's net casts wide, though it, though its meshes are coarse, nothing slips through. Second translation. The Tao is always at ease. It overcomes without competing, answers without speaking a word, arrives without being summoned, accomplishes without a plan. Its net covers the whole universe, and though its meshes are wide, it doesn't let a thing slip through. Third translation, being overbold and confident is deadly. The wise use of caution will keep you alive. One is the way to death, and the other is the way to preserve your life. Who can understand the workings of heaven? The Tao of the universe does not compete, yet wins, does not speak, yet responds, does not command, yet is obeyed, and does act, but is good at directing. The nets of heaven are wide, but nothing escapes its grasp. And the fourth and final translation. Those who dare to be bold die. Those who dare to be careful survive. So what do you want to do? Why is life like that, you ask? I don't know. This is how Tao works. It doesn't push itself, and it always succeeds. It acts silently, and it always reacts. It can't be summoned. It comes whenever it's ready. It can't be rushed. It's always on time. Heaven casts a wide net with big holes, Lao Tzu used to say, but nothing ever gets by it. Comments. Letting nature take its course. Nothing happens that isn't supposed to happen. Kind of got that out of it. Right, so I kind of get the impression that this is why my garden isn't working the way I want it to. I was in the garden on Tuesday. We had some sunshine in Scotland, right? This is a rare, rare thing. We don't, we don't see it that often. So I thought, you know, I'll take the opportunity to go in my garden, get it all weeded out, get it all tidied up, get the greenhouse sorted, and I'm going to start planting soon. And I thought to myself, maybe I should do it now, because if I start planting now, they should be ready by Friday. I can start picking all my vegetables by Friday, because that's the time scale that I want it done on. I kind of get the impression that this chapter is telling me otherwise. Everything's going to happen in its own natural time, and we can't rush things. I like the the first translation where it says um, it has no aim, and yet its purpose is always fulfilled. What do you think that means? I'm glad you asked. So we, um, when we're in recovery, we tend, to, we tend to set ourselves goals, and the goals lead on to unrealistic expectations, just like I say about my garden. When we're in sobriety, we normally set ourselves a couple of goals, right? I want to go 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. And when I get to that... I want to quit smoking, too, at the same time and quit sugar all at once, right? You could do that as long as as long as long it doesn't involve chocolate. I'm not quitting chocolate. Okay. So 
by um, by setting these unrealistic expectations, or or if we actually achieve the expectations, we're setting we're, we're setting ourselves a goal. So it makes us look like we've actually achieved something, which gives us a, a sense of finality. So I've now reached that goal. I don't need to do anything now because I can just I can just do what I want. Because I think this chapter is telling us that we can, you know, if we don't set a goal, if we live a life by a purpose, if we have a purposeful life rather than a goalful or um, uh, a life. Hey, hey Greg. Yeah. That you know that really doesn't say that it has no aim. It says it seems to have no aim. That's that's to our perception. That's that, that's that's how we see it. We, we see it as just things are just aimlessly happening. You know, there's there's no big purpose in it. There's, but there's no really a purpose behind it, right? Yeah, yeah but it's yeah. one that we're not qualified to see. Yeah, it's the same as reading. It's the same as reading Genesis in the Bible. You know, you think to yourself, "How did that happen?" You don't have to understand how it happened. We just have to accept the fact that it has happened. It is happening, and everything's going to happen in its own time. We can't rush it. Are we there yet? I took a vacation with my son, or several, when he was little. He was in the second grade, and I had a friend of mine actually in recovery, and we were supposed to take a Jeep trip. I had a Jeep Wrangler, and we are supposed to take a trip out west and ride for a week. And he canceled on me last minute. And I asked my wife, I said, do you think Max could uh, handle this? He's like, eight years old. And she said, well, I don't know. And I asked him and uh, I said, I want to take you out with me and let's go ride. And if you get tired and want to come home, we'll just turn around and come home. We live in Georgia. Now we're talking about riding to New Mexico and then doing a big loop around through Colorado and Grand Canyon and all this stuff. So if you get tired, we'll just come home. We'll just turn around at any moment. No agenda. He said, okay. And I gave him a digital camera. I had one of those big Mavica digital cameras, right? One of those huge ones then. And I said, uh, I'll download the pictures every night, and we can just ride. Uh, and I said, remember, the trip is the vacation, not the destination, right? That kind of a thing. So we took off. And he loved it. And this was on a Saturday that we left. And the following Friday, I mean, we went up into Colorado. I can tell you all about this trip. And then um, every time we went to, we had a rule that we never ate anywhere that we could eat at home, you know, so we didn't stop at any fast food. Now, this is an eight-year-old kid that's used to eating fast, you know, all that stuff, right? So he's snapping pictures everywhere, enjoying it. And on the following Friday, he says, Dad, I'm going to take a nap. If I miss something, wake me up. I said, okay. So that's how much he was enjoying it. And we ended up doing these every year. We did one of these for the next, until he got old enough to where he said, Dad, I can't miss school. I've got too much going on. I'm too busy to take a week off of school to go with you out west. So that was in middle school. But uh, uh, it was one of those kind of things like you're talking about, Craig. It's the same approach to recovery, I think is that we approach it as a journey rather than a destination. No, the other way. A destination, not a journey. No, it's a journey. It's, no, it's a journey. I, I, I meant we're not supposed to approach it as a destination. Yes, yes. Thank yes. you. Yes. That was yeah. big for me. I think I've been mentioning that, like, I kept want to get a year. I'll be able to leave Virginia and go get, go back to my regular life as if it was just something that I can complete have something to show for it and I'll be ready to go. And it's just, it's not linear like that, you know? Um, and that was, uh, that was big for me to, to surrender to. You know, and in the, in the same way, I came to recovery thinking my problem was alcohol when my problem was buddy. Craig? Yeah. When, when I got to around about a year as well, I just sat and think, what next? It wasn't until somebody says me day 366, that's what's next. It kind of all <laughs> fell into place because I, I then thought, do you know what? I was I was focusing on year two, not day 366. So by doing that, I was kind of losing sight of what was right in front of me. And if I tend to do that, I'm gonna I'm gonna stray. I'm, I'm looking at I'm 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 future projecting, I'm concentrating on what's happening 
far off in the future and I'm missing everything that's happening right now and I can miss some, some fantastic things by taking my eye off the ball let alone recovery I'm not just talking just recovery I'm talking about spending time with my son while he's this age I know I bang on about him I, I want him to be 16, 17 so he can go out and work and bring some rent in <laughs> but do you know what I'm going to miss him being nine I'm going to miss him growing up being nine I'm going to miss all the things that being a nine year old does and you know I just we want it to last forever, but we just need to, as long as we concentrate on what's going on right now, don't future trip. You know, it's that learning to live in the moment, Craig, because I, I really think that's what recovery brought to me more than anything was this realization that I never lived in the moment. I was always, you know, feeling guilty for something I didn't get accomplished yesterday. Yeah. It reminds or, me of the- Worrying about me, tomorrow, you know. Yeah, it reminds me of the story of the um, the old timer at the meeting, and one of the guys come up and says, I, "I wish I had your thirty years." And he turns around and says, "Well, I wish I had your thirty days, because I know it's the journey and not the actual destination." So yeah. I, th- I think what he's trying to impress on the fact is, look, enjoy what you're doing. It might be rough, what we're doing, but we're doing it for a reason, and the lessons that we can learn from what we're doing are absolutely phenomenal. Marla. I, th- I think we get caught up. You know, I was just thinking about that, having a year um, or, you know, counting the amount of time that we have in sobriety. And when we we break that, you know, by relapsing, how um, how much suffering it creates within us, most of us, you know, how, how we just take that self-flagellation and hit ourselves. And cre- it creates a lot of suffering to have a goal like, I'm going to make a year and I'm going to feel really good. And then what? And if you don't make the year, it creates so much suffering within you. And I'm I'm just speaking for myself that um, I'm not letting the Tao happen. I'm not letting nature take its course. It's, you know, like relapse happens to be a part of my journey, whatever, for whatever that is. And, um, I want to create less suffering because of it. I, I don't want to be beating myself up because I, I didn't make a year, you know. And But, I, you know, on the flip side is when people give me kudos, when we give everybody kudos for making that year or two years or 30 years, how great that feels. Yeah, it's you know? confusing for me in that route because it's like, in one way, I've always been really anti day count kind of thing just Me too. Like, yeah I've had my my relapses and they've been much much different in the past you know two years than they were five or ten years ago when I was struggling um the idea that you're starting all over from day one it's as if you didn't learn anything that you didn't learn anything from the relapse you know you maybe go back to step one you maybe you know the day count um really messed with me, especially as a binge drinker, because I was not a daily drinker ever, you know, and I could go months without drinking. And once a binge happened, four or five days of my life are gone, I wake up in a hospital. So it's like, you know, this 30 days, 90 days, never really. Yeah. Um, and, and then at the same time, it's like the accolades of like, yay, you know, you know, you got the, you got the 30 days, you got the year. It's like, I just, I don't, I guess I just don't put, you know, the take what you can and leave what you don't. I take a little bit of it, you know, like I, I take a little bit of it, but I don't put too much on it. And, buddy, I think you said something really good about you're going to relapse so you're done relapsing, you know, or something to that nature as in like, you know, there's a reason. It, it, I have learned something from each one of them, um, not so much from the older ones, but, you know, my more recent ones it's like you really do pinpoint where what's not working what am I doing that's not working what am I doing that's working and um it's an important tool you know you learn more from your mistakes than yeah you learn what we gonna do Marla yeah I totally agree with you um what, what I've noticed in my relapses is each one is not as bad as the one before so I must be learning something yeah. um and uh, I think the accumulation of time, I don't think that we lose the time mm. that we put into the recovery once when we relapse. I think it's just part of, in this body, part of my 
my uh, disease is that I need to, I don't want to say I need to relapse, but I do yeah. feel like I need to just to learn. There are times that I'm like, yeah, you know, it's, it's every time that uh, it happens, it's like, oh yeah, this is what happens when you did this X, Y, and Z. And um, then you're more aware of when you're doing X, Y, and Z. Um, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a double-edged sword this is. time, you know, when you're in recovery, not so much, you know, when you're at, when you're working at it, not just dry drinking, you know. And then there's the other part of it is it, it's in my nature. <laughs> it's like, it's in my nature to want to be, uh, t- to want to be buzzed or high. I, f- and I f- really believe that, yeah. that I am most, I feel most comfortable and in my body when I have a nice buzz going on. You know, Marla, though, this, the whole idea of recovery is to change your nature, though. Yes. That's the whole which idea. Where, which is where I was going. It's, yeah. The yeah. whole point of this is, is, is this, this journey of recovery is to start to feel comfortable without substances. Yeah. I really think I about it like a tree that's growing that the more that I focus on my recovery, the more this tree grows, that's my recovery. And I can, eventually this tree can support me and I have to continue to feed it and allow it to grow in my life to where it's able. Uh, And I remember the day that happened. I remember the day the cloud, it was like a cloud. It just came over me that I would have relapsed in the past. And all of a sudden I said, you know, I don't need to relapse. There's clouds here. It's here. But I don't need to now right. because I've allowed recovery to grow enough that, that it's able to support me. And I haven't drank since. And that, that was where surrender came in. Yes. Me, that was. I mean, I, I was the same way, buddy. I had that dark cloud. I mean, that was the, that my day one was the darkest day of my life. I mean, I literally thought I was going to die that day. And it turned out, once I surrendered, it was probably the best day of my life. Yeah, yeah, it's uh, it's amazing, it's amazing. Craig, Craig's uh, Craig's going crazy. Let me get Craig in. Come on, Craig. <laughs> right. So you, you, you were talking about a tree. I, I look at my sobriety as a as a child. So at the moment, my my, my sober child is one thousand two hundred and sixty two days old, and I do that by thank you very much. Like, no, it's okay, please. Um, I, when, when we count days, we, we, I don't do it. I don't do it just to say, "Look at me, look at me." I look at it to try and encourage the people um, that are coming on as well, because we need to give them that spark of inspiration, that spark of a little bit of hope that they can do it. Um, and then I think when they get to a certain point, their spark of motivation starts to become inspiration for other people, so they start to inspire the ones that are, that are coming through the doors and just find their feet in so bright as well. Um, and by by focusing on my sobriety, not my not my addiction, I've got a whole new mind shift to it. I'm not stuck in what I was doing. I'm not stuck in the rut of my story. I'm now I'm now basically focusing on what what I'm doing. And it comes back down to this chapter as well. Just focusing on staying in the moment. If I if I want my if I want my sober child to 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 flourish, I need to educate it. So instead of sending it to school, I bring it to meetings. Um, I feed it relevant information. I feed it good stuff about recovery. I, f- I feed it good spiritual stuff. I don't. I don't poison it. I don't. I don't give it shit. I, I try to give it a, a nice balanced diet that's going to help bring it on and nurture it. Um, and I surround it by people that are going to inspire and motivate it too as well. Um, and just just realize that this this is where I belong. This is where we belong. This this is the environment that we like to live in. Um, we have a we have a roll call once every week. Um, just again, going back to the counting days, we have, we have a roll call. So every Sunday we put up how many days we've got. And the ones with the bigger numbers, they tend to get a few likes and a few love hearts on it. But the ones with the smaller numbers, that's the ones that we always keep the praise on. That's the ones that we that's the ones that we keep all the love on it to say, look, day one is amazing. Day two, day two is fantastic. Day three was my third favourite day in recovery. It's absolutely amazing. So I think it's, it's focusing on what's going on right now and just encouraging everybody to come along and do the best that they can do and be the best that they can be. It doesn't. It doesn't matter how everybody else perceives everybody else. We shouldn't be looking at. We shouldn't be living our lives through other people's filters. We should be focusing on what's going on right now, what we are doing, and concentrating on on everything that's around us now. 
and learn and learning those tools that help us. I, I've got a question for everyone. In the Stephen Mitchell translation, his first line says, "The Tao is always at ease, always." And I'm thinking of areas of my life when I have issues, when I'm not at ease, there's no reason I can't be at ease at all times in all things. And I'm thinking, thinking that's what this chapter is telling me is giving me this example of the Tao as being at ease. Um, And these other translations talk about those who dare to be bold die and i'm i'm thinking that's more of those who choose to be the director rather than play their part you know we have that in the the third i think that's part of the third step that uh here it is page 62 this is the how and the why of it first of all we had to quit playing god it didn't work next we decided that hereafter in this drama of life god was going to be the director He's the principal. We're the agents. If if you're in a play, if I have a part in a play and Craig has a part in a play, and Craig's character is mean to my character, and he says awful, angry, hurtful things to me in the play, when the play's over, do I pop Craig and beat Craig up because he said all these mean things about me, or I get this huge no? He's just playing his part, you know. We can go off and have a cold drink together and have lunch and enjoy ourselves, right? I mean, it would be silly for every time that two people acted that they had some big brawl after the <laughs> after the scene, right? That's just silly. And what this is telling me is that life should be the same way, that if we're playing our part rather than trying to direct the show, that the the issues that we have in life, we don't have to take personally. We can learn to live at ease. Um, oh, Craig. Go ahead. I was going to say it, it could be considered a spiritual death, not a physical death. Again, when I, when I see these readings, when it says somebody's going to die, I'm thinking, oops, he's just, he's just pegged it there. No, it, it could be a spiritual death. It could be a slow, a, a slow death that um, you just fade out of, fade out of relevance. Um, and you stop loving, you stop caring, you become that bitter, twisted person. To me, that would be that'd probably be worse than death, just to go back to what I was like. You know, because I used to take everything personally. I could be riding down the road. I mean, I, I would have times I would think about something that happened years ago and get mad about it again. And I'm like, what is this? Why am I getting mad about something that happened 10 years ago? It has no bearing on my life now. That is not taking life at ease. Because you need, you need another fourth step. That's, that's what you need. Yeah. I mean, you've got to learn not to take these things personally, right? You've not dealt with it properly. Yes, exactly, Craig. It, it we'll creates talk about suffering that. whenever we'll you talk. take something personally. And yep. it creates suffering. And it's never personal. Yeah. We'll talk about it on Friday, buddy. I'll, I'll, put, I'll put it in my diary. Thank you, Craig. I appreciate that. Um I was trying to look and see if there was something over in the, uh, any other comments before we start moving towards some other things? Um, The Tao of the universe does not compete, yet wins, does not speak, yet responds, does not command, but obey, does not act, but is good at directing. So all these things get accomplished does not push itself, but it succeeds. Act silently. Can't be summoned, but comes whenever it's ready. Can't be rushed, but is always on time. All these descriptions, right? How about this? This is the Jonathan Starr. Bold action against others leads to death. Bold action in harmony with the Tao leads to life. Good fortune, bad fortune. One seems to bring benefit, the other cause harm, but heaven rejects them both. Both in the end, tether men to this to this world. Who can know the reason of heaven? 
who can know its endless ways. Not even the sage has an answer to this one. Heaven's ways, heaven's way does not strive, yet it always overcomes. Does not speak, yet it responds. It's not summoned, yet it appears. Does not hurry, yet it completes everything on time. The net of heaven spans the universe, yet not the slightest thing ever slips by. This idea that nothing is lost, right? There was something here I wanted to read you guys. Um, uh, it does not use words to respond. It does not ask, yet naturally supplied with all its needs. It is not hurried. Heaven casts a wide net, and its holes are large, yet nothing slips through. We're so worried about these little things, but nothing gets lost in this whole. It reminds me, Rob, of the uh, Romans 8, talking about that every detail of our life works into something good. Every detail. We're so concerned about all these little things. And that's where my angst and my lack of ease really comes from. It comes from all these things that my fears. It comes from me being afraid things are not going to work out. And I can use gratitude to look back and see these things working in spite of me, not because of me. And if I can do that, I, th this is just really a, for me, a, a chapter of confidence, a chapter of promise that it's going to work in spite of me, regardless. Mm -hmm. I can either be at ease or I can be upset. Either way, this is going to work out. How many situations have we been in where we've been all tense and tight and upset? And it work out, or I could have taken the same situation if a uh, future buddy could have talked to past buddy <laughs> and said, "Listen, just relax. It's going to be okay. <laughs> don't don't get so tied up about this. It's going to be fine. It's going to work out." If future buddy could have talked to this buddy or past buddy, if I was in a situation, that's what I would have said. There's never been a situation I wouldn't have told past buddy that you know <laughs> never a time any comments we're in the center of god's will whether we know it or not the net lets nothing through if we're not at ease there is a problem 12 and 12 page 76 says that the chief activator of our defects has been self-centered fear. Primarily fear that we would lose something that we already possessed or would fail to get something we demanded. Living upon a basis of unsatisfied demands, we were in a state of continual disturbance and frustration. Therefore, no peace was to be had or no ease, right, unless we could find a means of reducing these demands. The difference between a demand and a simple request is plain to, plain to anyone. We had to reduce our demands. We were afraid we were going to lose something that we had or not get something we wanted, so it caused us not to be at ease. That's good. That's good. Let's move to Wayne Dyer. Marla, what do you have in Wayne Dyer today? Anything good? The whole chapter. The whole chapter. Um, Let me. Know, out of all these guys that, that uh, uh, well, he he's just seems to be the clearest and most black and white out of, out of all the translators. Um, he calls his chapter Living in Heaven's Net. But I'll read the verse. Um. Bold action against others leads to death. Bold action in harmony with the Tao leads to life. 
both of these things sometimes benefit and sometimes injure, injure. It's heaven's way to conquer without striving. It does not speak, yet it is answered. It does not ask, yet it is supplied with all that it needs. It does not hurry, yet it completes everything on time. The net of heaven catches all. Its mesh is coarse, but nothing slips through. Once again, you see the Tao through a paradoxical lens. After all, what is, quote, the net of heaven? It's the invisible world where all of the 10,000 things originate. And while it appears to have many openings or ways to escape the inevitability of the intentions of the Tao, no one and no thing can exist beyond what the Tao orchestrates. So Lao Tzu is asking you to change the way you look at bravado and courage. Rather than seeing these qualities as admirable, he asks you to be less of a dauntless hero and more vigilant and alert in order to, get, to live the great way. Note that the way of heaven is to eschew both is to eschew bold actions and remain cautious. Lao Tzu offers you four examples of how the net of heaven holds everything within its grasp without having to be forceful or reckless. And you're encouraged to emulate that in all of your undertakings. Number one, it's heaven's way to conquer without striving. See how the Tao is peaceful, silent, and always the conqueror. No human can command the sun to cool down. (laughs) Man versus nature or ocean currents to stop, or winds to subside, rain to cease, or crops to quit growing. This is all handled naturally and perfectly without any effort by the Tao. Nature always wins because the Tao simply does it all without needing to attack or strive. Be like this and relax in heaven's net. You know, I I keep, the, the Tao talks in such big terms you know, of just nature, it doesn't really talk about human nature so much. It doesn't? I mean, yeah, I, I think it's the same, though. I think we can take that and bring it down to the most relevant uh, thing that happens, you know, the, the smallest little thing that happens in our life, because we're part of that same nature, you know. Uh, Craig, go ahead. Uh I think the I think the smaller picture is when if we if we look at the steps when we're um, if, if we're struggling with things like God we can replace the word God with um, um, something else that's more tangible that relates to us I think we can do the exact same with the Tao um, if, if it talks about casting a big net over heaven we can say it's casting a big net over our lives um, yeah. Yeah. it's capturing this that and the other so I, I think just really if we we down. Not, not so much downsize it, but downscale it to fit into our level of thinking. I don't, I don't mean level as in we're, we're silly or we're not understanding them, but just what's going on in our lives at the moment. If we're, if, if we're struggling on the bigger picture, like we can't see the forest for the trees, let's look at the trees for a little bit and let's, let's just kind of narrow things down, put the blinkers on and just concentrate on, again, what's, what's really in front of us, what's, what's going on in our lives rather than the big massive picture. It just seems to be in... Um, in, in our nature to fight nature. It seems the the struggle is man versus nature, and it, it just uh, it's been written down for obviously, you know, five thousand years. Man That's versus nature. It seems to be in our nature to want to fight nature. It's because we're that used to being in control of things. We're that used to wanting control of things. We have to we have to admit we're powerless over the universe. We're, we're powerless over the nature of life. Our lives are becoming unmanageable because we can't accept this. We have to accept it. You know, we, we're not here to, man, man's not here to rule nature. Nature rules. Nature rules. <laughs> we need to remember that as well. I think it's a big thing which keeps a lot of people out of recovery is that powerlessness. Or a lot, a lot of people, you could say, out of the ease of life, Craig, you could even take it broader than recovery because for me, me learning my place in nature is not as much the fight of nature it's finding where i fit mm-hmm. how to yeah. get into that flow of nature that i don't understand uh and i approach it from a fight we we have this uh, we say it's intelligence that causes us to to want I, I don't know if it's a higher intelligence or not in reality 
because you look at animals and you look at how they know how to flow with nature. You know, we say we're smarter, you know, (laughs) but I don't know. I don't really know if that's the case or not, you know, but we have to find this flow and that's the whole, the whole rub. And for me, that came from the surrender, you know, and once I surrendered, it changed my life. Because me trying to fit recovery into my life did not work. I mean, I fought it because I didn't know how. And I think really that desire for surrender is the same as the desire to find a God or this desire because we're seeking where we fit. I agree. And we can't. And finding where we fit is really the the issue or has been for me. Brian, you want to speak? You want me to unmute you? Hold on. Okay. Hey, you have hey I, I've enjoyed the conversation. I, I think this whole chapter for me was summed up last night when I was in a meeting. There was uh, 11 people there, and this young lady came in, and she had been, this was her first week. She had five days sober, so this was her second meeting. And there's this one individual that was in the meeting that can't stay sober. He just can't. He's been fighting it, like you said, buddy. And um, uh, anyway, she came into the meeting late, and she sat next to the guy, and the guy was her childhood friend. So the guy that's been struggling, this young lady that came in, so it was beautiful to watch how that net, you know, allowed her to connect with somebody, and he was able to share about that, you know, his struggles, and she said she wants the chaos to end, but it goes back to that surrender that you were talking about um, and not trying to force, you know, what we do on to people. It's uh, being available and, and knowing that the net will catch them. And uh, mm-hmm. I think the Tao speaks to that, you know, being open to what we see at the moment and being uh, able to, to know that, you know, I'm not in control of what happens to that individual. Cause I knew she was new cause it's a small meeting. And anytime somebody new comes in, we want to try to cater to her. And it was beautiful the way that just unfolded. And Brian didn't have to do anything special. So I said, I've only got five days. And the one thing I did say was, you know, everybody once upon a time had five days in this room. (laughs) So it's it's just a willingness to be having your heart open and knowing that it's uh, it's available. So thanks for letting me. And I'm enjoying the conversation that everybody's having. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Brian. Craig? I think that's a great example of things happening because they're supposed to happen. There was nobody interfering in that sort of thing. There was no um there was no pre you know pre preconceived meet up at that particular meeting. Things things just happen like that because they're supposed to. Uh, because they needed to, right? Yep, absolutely. Yep. And we've no control over it. You know, and, and the question for me is okay. How do I get into this? How do I allow things to start happening naturally? How can I, how can I not interfere with it? Yeah, how can I not interfere with this flow? Um, the 23rd chapter says, open yourself to the Tao, then trust your natural responses and everything will fall into place. So it's about being open. It's about the surrender. It's about what can I do for you instead of what can you do for me? That's how I open my heart. A lot of times is by trying to be kind to you instead of trying to manipulate you. Me not going into a situation thinking I have the situation figured out already. I just need to get you to do what I want you to do. That's how I used to approach every situation. I would, before I went into it, it was like a chess game. I knew what move I wanted to make. I knew what move I needed you to make. So now how can I get you to make the move I want you to make? Because I know what's right and I know what I need. Now, if I learn to come into situations instead with an open heart, what can I do for you? I don't see the whole picture. What, what is the need? How, how can I, you know, what is my part in this? Being open instead of being totally closed, thinking I know what's best. That in itself helps to put me into the flow. Rob? So as always, um, stuff's new to me. So 
bear with the crazy train in my head. Um, <laughs> if, if I'm telling somebody new in a meeting or a group that I have, you know, X amount of days and there are, you know, a few more than them, and I've got the attitude that I've got, I've got a, a, a hole in my heart for them and what I want to portray to them is that I've got a new life and I've found something that's giving me joy at the core. And this is why I have these days, not because I'm afraid that if I don't hit six months, nine months, get my one year chip, you know, people are going to look bad at me and I've, I'm doing this out of fear. I think that changes the dialogue for myself. So I'm doing it for them, not because I'm in fear, because I've not learned much. But one thing I'm learning is if I'm fear-based, um, I'm dry, and it's going to unravel at any moment. So I don't know if that perspective helps, but yeah, I'm not proud to say I have X amount of days, but I'm, I'm really doing it more for them. If that makes sense? It does, Rob. Yeah. Go ahead, Mark. Not, not all the time, though, because I'm still me, and I'm I'm still going. Hey, look at me! But I'm getting more. I should say I'm getting more that way than I used to be. And this is stepping back from our ego. Also, I think this this chapter, which really is in all of these chapters, stepping back from the ego and allowing nature to take its course, not not imposing our will and our fears and our you know our sense of how great we are because we just had five days sober or 30 years sober, you know, everybody, if we just step back, but I just, if we just step back, that's the, the second to the last paragraph in this Wayne Dyer. Um, it, you know, it's about stepping back and allowing events to unfold naturally. Bravery is a, a fine quality, but reckless behavior, bravery, that is where you rush in without thinking. And I often rush in without thinking. I often speak without thinking. It's a sure way to invite disaster. In this provocative verse, Lao Tzu is telling you to think before you act, which also I think think before you speak. Allow heaven's way to do the conquering without your having to fight or defeat anyone. Very often, your first impulse is dominated by your ego's need to win and conquer, which is, I think, what Rob was just talking about. Um, I saw this as a competitive tennis player. By not striving, I'd often emerge victorious over younger, stronger, and sometimes more talented players. The reckless overheating of the ball by my opponent would cause him to make unnecessary errors, which... While I stayed in the backcourt and simply returned the ball in what appeared to be effortless harmony. And this created more of a desire to win in my recklessly brave opponent, causing him to make even more mistakes. I call this young man's disease. <laughs> and this is sitting in me. I, uh, this I, I relate to sitting in meetings. Be an active listener. Rather than attempting to control others by speaking frequently and loudly, allow yourself to become an active listener. Many of the answers you seek and the results you expect from others will surface if you can remember not to speak or even ask. Try living in accord with nature, which listening rather than pushing, striving, or demanding will help you do. We can all take a lesson in that is learning how to listen better and, um, you know, not anticipating what we should say when somebody's speaking or not anticipating what they're going to say. That's a quite a, it's difficult, but it's a, you know, definitely a lesson to be learned. You, you know, Marla, with that, if I'm listening to you, I'm, I'm taking, I'm taking into account what you're saying and, and uh, your value to me. If I'm listening to you, how many conversations have I had over the years? If I'm not careful, I will do it now. 
I'll be thinking, I wish they would hurry up because I've got to do this and this and this. <laughs> One of my issues with the meetings I went to back then is that people would, it would take me so much effort to speak at a meeting and half the people weren't listening. And I'd be, I'm thinking, why am I, I I'm so anxious about speaking my truth here and half the people aren't listening. They're in their own world. They're on their, God forbid, on their phones. Or somebody would bring a kid in and they'd be all focused on the kid and I'd be speaking. I'm like, what the fuck? And that, and that, that was such a turnoff that I would stop going. That's why one of the reasons I stopped going to meetings like that is because people, half the people aren't listening. It's well, for me, I had to learn that if I was sharing in a meeting, it was for whoever was listening. That if they right. weren't listening, right. that that's not up to me. I I've had a I've had someone get up while I was sharing. Sometimes I said, "Wait a minute, why are you getting up? I'm going to say something that might change your life. You need to listen to me." <laughs> <laughs> if I was taking myself too seriously, I would say something like that just to make fun of myself. You know, that's a big ego. I know. Oh, it's huge. You know, so I got to get it out there sometimes. I actually said that in a meeting one time. So why are you getting up? What I'm saying will change your life. You need to listen to me. <laughs> and just laugh it off, you know, when I thought it was too important, you know. But uh, Before you get to know all the people in your meetings, it, for me, it was just so much anxiety to speak, even. You know, and that to sit there and speak and have people looking around or getting up to go to the bathroom or get coffee or like, oh, is what I'm saying not valuable? And then I would, and that's ego also, is, you know, is all that. So, anyways, I started showing up in online meetings. It's a lot easier <laughs> for some reason. But, you know, we, we, we grow up and we learn, you know, how to handle this stuff, you know. Yes. yes. And, and, it, and we can be at ease no matter in what aspect we are and what phase and what part of this flow of nature we're in so that, we learn that it's not up to us to compete, to to have what we need, or that we don't have to dominate the conversation to give the answers that we need, or we don't have to, you know, bulldoze our plan to accomplish <laughs> what needs to be accomplished. Um, you know, all those things where we can answer this with ease instead of answering it with this overbold push, 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 mm -hmm. because that's the two options that I see here is we can either push our way through this or we can, you know, or we can answer all of this with ease. Brian, you have something? Yeah, I, I think that uh, listening is a skill that I had to learn. And sometimes in meetings, uh, regardless of what people are saying, I think just being there is it's an important element that a lot of times we forget about. Yeah. Um, and, and again, I want to say the most profound things in every, <laughs> you know, interaction I have, because I want you to know, I got degrees, I got this accomplishment, you know, I want you to know exa ex exactly who you're talk talking to, you know, <laughs> Einstein and me are hanging out together, but, uh, you know, I, that's where, you know, the more I subject myself to what other people are doing and being able to just listen and be a part of instead of being separate. I think that's what I learned because I got sober in England and, you know, it just it was one of those things where it was small groups. You know, we just had to learn how to respect the meeting. And then you come into some larger groups and, and people are doing their own thing and you know, you have to set aside a lot of things, or I had to set aside a lot of th things, you know, based on what it was that I was experiencing at that moment versus what I thought it should be like for me. And I think that's what you were talking about earlier with chapter, um, the third step, you know, trying to be the director, even in meetings, you know, trying to direct the show and how it should be and how it was in England. Now it's I'm in the States and, you know, I was in California and it should be, you know, all of that stuff that I do to myself, but it starts with just listening and being in the moment and yeah. being all of what people are saying. And, you know, my initials are BS. <laughs> so, you know, I got to accept that, you know, 
characteristic that there might be a lot of BS being slung, and that's okay, too. <laughs> well, one practice I've taken is, is when I come into a meeting, taking a moment and open my heart to each person there individually, kind of saying a short little, maybe while the readings are going on or Sometimes I get bored during, you know, somebody's talk. I'll I'll try to open my heart to everyone there that's go around the room and then listen, try to listen as best I can to who is sharing. Um, because what they're sharing is important to them, whether it's important to me or not. Right. And if I can make what they're sharing important to them, maybe what I share might be important to them too. You know, I can give in listening to these people that I don't want to listen to, you know. <laughs> and then maybe they'll listen to me. You know, maybe I'll get, to, you know, maybe, you know, maybe, maybe what I say might be important to them. Who knows? You know, um, but that's uh, that's part of learning to live in ease, you know, learning to live in that. You have something, Brian? Yeah, I was going to say the analogy that Craig used about his garden. You know, sometimes, you know, I, I'm, I'm worried about his garden because I want it to, you know, be, you know, beautiful and whatever. But sometimes we don't see the um, the results of our actions for a while. And just like being in a meeting or just my presence there and being able to listen to when somebody's speaking, you know, the the benefits of that or the pr- the, the fruit that comes from that is, Sometime down the road, somebody may say, man, I really appreciate you looking at me when I'm sharing, you know, just like the uh, the garden analogy that Craig used. So I think that's very apropos to what we're talking about today. That eye contact is crucial. Yeah. I've learned that if I'm in a meeting and they're calling on people, if I want to be called on, I make eye contact with every person until they call on me. <laughs> 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 because they will. And if I don't want to be called on i just don't make eye contact and maybe they won't call on me at all you know it's funny how that works though if i pay attention to someone they're going to pay attention to me any other comments it's been a good discussion today yep we're right where we need to be yep there's nothing else then we'll close guys anything drew good to have you sir glad you could make it today for your first meeting with us and Brian. Nice to meet you, Brian. Yeah. Thanks, Marla. All right, guys. Well, if there's no – oh, Craig's raised his hand. You raise your hand again, Craig? No, it was just to talk about the garden again. That's right. It's just what Brian's saying, you know, we, we, um, we, we don't realize how, how quickly things grow. We um, – Louise had lost Callum. Well, we lost Callum one time. He, oh, his, ball, his ball had rolled out at the bottom of the garden. And I've got like 15 sacks of potatoes that I grow sunflower plants and this, that, and other. And the bottom of the garden is just a mass. Of, if you ever see the film Day of the Triffids, that's what it was like. It was just like all this greenery. And out comes Callum like Indiana Jones with his ball. <laughs> <laughs> so cute. So it, it does take time, but it's, I, think when you, I think when you get involved in that sort of thing, you start to enjoy it, you realise just just how easy we have to take things, not rush things, not push things. We can't, we can't force a flower to, a flower to open up and, and bloom. We just, it's the same with our lives as well. We just need to take things a day at a time. We, we really have to approach our life in the, in that way. All we're seeing here is a description of the Tao and how the Tao works. You know, it's kind of the same way in our lives. We, we just do the things that make our life grow or make our life, um, die and then we're not really in control of it growing <laughs> we just do the things that help you know so for me that would be I do the things that bring me to this place of ease I think of you instead of me in more moments of the day I learn to live in the moment rather than in the future of the past where my fear lives you know, if I can stay in the moment, my fear is normally not there. That's where I can love you. I can't love you in the future or the past. But I can love you in the moment. I can be kind to you in the moment. I can get rid of my uh, suffering, my discontent in the moment. Paul? Gratitude. Yes. Gratitude. That's what it boils down to, isn't it? 
It does. Gratitude will bring me back to the moment every time. Yeah. Okay, guys, if there's nothing else, we'll call it there. Y'all have a great week. Hello, this is Buddy C. I wanted to make you aware of several recovery-related resources that I've posted in the episode description. These resources include a list of recovery podcasts, a free sober meditation app, daily recovery email, shared Google recovery calendars, and how to join the SRC and attend this meeting live. Hope you put some of these resources to use and have a great week. Thank you for listening to the Tao of Our Understanding Recovery Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please share this podcast with your friends in recovery. Uh-huh.